met Simone and Nadine on the podcast. Well, you didn't actually technically meet them, but I spoke about uh, Simone and Nadine. I bragged about them. They're amazing. Let me just read so I don't just tell you, you know, gush about them. Nadine Heal and Simone Fazil are pioneers of reward-based training in Europe and among the avid students of Susan Garrett. Nadine was personally mentored by Susan and traveled throughout Europe and Canada to learn from a variety of workshops and conferences. She did. She was like a little bit of a stalker. I wasn't too concerned because she seemed kind of nice in order to com- continuously improve her knowledge and skills in animal training. Simone and Nadine offer a two-year training program, online memberships, and courses for pet owners and dog lovers in uh, Hoopers and other programs. Several thousand students participating in their online programs that has been translated into five languages. Mine hasn't. Nadine studied geography and biology while Simone studied psychology and pedagogy. They, you'll, you'll have to Google that one I did. They train their dogs in various disciplines and take in fosters with difficult histories. So I'm going to bring Simone and welcome ladies. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? So fine. Um, Very world, good. The world got to meet Frida today on the podcast. And why don't you paint a picture of just like the first moments when you picked her up? Did you intend on keeping her? Like what happened there? Yes, yes. So first of all, congratulations to oh, the 200th episode. Very exciting. Thank <laughs> and thank you so much for that awesome Frida podcast uh, today. Oh, I'm just so proud um, of what you guys have been able to do. It's been amazing. Thank you. So yes, uh, Frida, we actually, we intended to keep her. So she was uh, never supposed to be just a foster dog. Like we take in foster dogs uh, from time to time, but with her, we actually, we wanted to keep her. Well, I wanted to. You were <laughs> more decided than I was, but uh, yeah, Frida just somehow stole my heart. So <laughs> wait a minute, you wanted to, Simone, you must've been crushed when she attached herself to Nadine. <laughs> So in the beginning, it was kind of okay for me because I thought, yeah, it will be more Nadine's dog. So (laughs) it was kind of okay. So when you first got her, what were your first impressions? Because first impressions are so important. Yeah, she was certainly very impressive. That's uh, (laughs) certainly the perfect word to to describe her behavior. Yes, and she's like... uh, you would say an intense dog like when you meet her she's like a lot of dog because she's not big but she's just uh, yeah mm. like a lot of dog <laughs> that's true <laughs> we already knew she had a lot of behavioral issues so we got her a real long list uh, but we didn't knew that she has also really severe separation anxiety and we noticed of course immediately that this was So what did they tell you was her, uh, how did they describe her? That might be better. Um, uh, She was, uh, she had uh, too much energy for everybody to handle her. And uh, she had a very strong hunting instinct. Mm -hmm. And actually um, she was described as that bad a puller uh, on leash that nobody would take for uh, her for walks anymore. And wow. yeah, yeah, and she was like uh, afraid of people, afraid of other dogs. Like there was a lot of excitement for her, but at the same time, she was scared of stuff. So it's just it was just difficult to handle her. But we were kind of prepared for all of this, but not actually for the separation anxiety. So that was just like on top of it. So yeah, it's came very as on top of your kids. <laughs> So now in a situation like that, it's so easy for people, and I've heard it when people rescue dogs, that they label those dogs by their past faults or their past mistakes. And so was that something that ever happened to the two of you? Well, we we try uh, not to do it because I think especially with rescue dogs, it's so important to not be intimidated by by a label because it it doesn't really matter right like it's just you just want to get the first training steps in like it's it's not about what people describe the dog to be but it's just about how can you 
take the first steps and then just go from there. But it's certainly a, an area where there will be a lot of labels. So normally the whole description of a rescue dog, when you read it online, it's normally a lot of labels. So yeah, we really feel uh, you shouldn't be intimidated by labels other have put on that dog. So mm -hmm. we have but another. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Nadine. We had another uh, case the year uh, before, which was uh, quite an extreme aggression uh, case, a foster dog that we took oh, in. But uh, it didn't matter to us. Like we, like the first step this dog took into our house, we just. We never really talked about his aggression anymore. We just started his training and we just like, we were very careful with him, uh, obviously, when we like handled him and everything, but it was just about starting the training, just about, yeah. Mm. We always change the name of the dog and then a new chapter starts. Exactly. It's I try to get people story. to do that for sure, for sure. Mm. So during the training, you know all about the hunting instinct that's so strong and her wanting to pull, the surprise of the separation anxiety. Was there any time during the process where you just went, like, what have we gotten ourselves into? This is crazy. Actually, no, because we so much trust the process. Oh, and I love uh, it. actually, really, of course, uh, thanks to you, we, we now feel so... Yeah, we feel, yeah, we feel secure with with just uh, um, taking these training steps. And uh, like, uh, if there is a point where you might say, "Well, it's not like going fast enough," or it's not uh, like the exactly di um, correct direction or something, then you can always change something, right? You can always think about what else can we do, what what other uh, approaches uh, might mm. there be. I think that a lot of times especially with rescues. And I know a lot of people reading or listening to this ha have had rescues or maybe are thinking of getting a rescue, but we have this vision in our mind of really, this is what it's supposed to be like with a dog. And then we have the reality of this is what it's like. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that big gap is what causes so much second doubt, so many people feeling uh, anxious and really anxiety and stress comes in. And we see it even in our online students and probably you guys see it in your students where people go, this isn't working or I don't know what else to do or I'm so frustrated. And when I see people writing things like that, I know that you have a vision of where you should be instead of looking at where you are and saying, mm -hmm. what can I do? What one thing can I do today to make this dog's mm -hmm. life more joyful? And when we mm -hmm. focus just on that joy, then things just keep getting better. So, and, and, but it's hard, it's difficult mm -hmm. um, for yeah. many yeah. people. But like you said, if you can just trust the process and it's not about the dog you think you want or you think you should have, mm -hmm. it's about the dog in front of you. And, mm -hmm. you know, Definitely. Back to, do you love her? And I know you two loved her right from the moment you got her. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That yes. A, that makes a big difference. So is mm -hmm. there something you say to your students when they get stuck in that gap and then they start blaming the dog and saying this dog isn't teachable or this dog can't learn, whatever? Yeah, we, we always try to... Um, so it's always important not to focus too much on the problem behaviors actually you don't have to get rid of problem behaviors first you can just start building new desired behaviors and this will also help keep you motivated because you will see a success in every training step and every living being has just 24 hours Except maybe uh, Susan Garrett <laughs> you seems have to have more, some more <laughs> hours, <laughs> but <laughs> and, um, I mean, if uh, if the dog has less time to practice uh, the unwanted behavior and uses up more time to exercise uh, the desired behavior, yeah, 
you you will be easily motivated to keep on yeah like for example with the leash walking like it's not even necessary to think about the pulling and think about how can we stop the pulling you just start to teach like healing like you just like it's fun walking mm -hmm. by my side beside mm -hmm. you yes mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, the focus shouldn't be on the stopping of something, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, because I think when you're doing that again, you're just creating more anxiety for yourself. She's still pulling, mm -hmm. she's not stopping. No, well, yeah. how's her healing? How's her mm -hmm. reinforcement? Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to fight against uh reinforcers that have been built up for years in frida's case just for one year but <laughs> yeah this is a great quote from tristan it's so hard to check our expectations and egos at the door it's just so important our dogs need that mm -hmm. from us they mm -hmm. absolutely they need it and it's super tough and so now you've added a new puppy and how's that dynamics in your house Oh, actually, we took it very slow at the beginning. So we always like uh, just introduce uh, a new dog, like one at a time to the other ones. And then we would uh, first just um, bring them together on walks. And then we use um, like uh, gates in the house to just take it slow. And like this, now we are on a really good uh, track. And uh, like there is more excitement again, of course, because everything changes a little bit. But it's, yeah, Frida is actually pretty fantastic. Yes. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. That's and awesome. it's, it's, it's so worth the time because we really want them to be really great friends for um, many, many years. So we, we like to take it slow and really, yeah, build a good relationship. Build a, a good relationship. Yeah. It's worth that investment for sure. If there's one thing you wish that pet owners understood, that if they understood this one thing, that their life with their dog would be so much easier, their life with their dog, they'd be more harmonious. What would you say that one thing would be? I, I will go first. <laughs> and I would just say, really see the front, the dog in front of you, as you already said, Susan. So it's... Mm -hmm. So important to not uh, think in labels, but just uh, watch the um, behavior and then go one step uh, from there. So you uh, just uh, see what the dog is doing and then you decide what will be the next step you, you need. And then there will always be success. Yeah, that's a for good me, one. For me, I think it's about layers, like because all of the training is done in layers right and the magical thing about layers is that at some point there will be this magical moment where you will have a situation that you maybe did not prepare for but it still works out <laughs> completely great because everything like comes together like all of the training that you have done um, like all the layers like come together and then you just realize like wow like with Frida I had several of these moments like wow now she's able to do this but I haven't really prepared well I have prepared her with the layers but not like this specific situation right so then it like like the efficiency of the training just expels ex ex excels yeah, excels. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think those are two really good ones that if people understood that behavior is more consistent, it's easier for you. It's easier for the dog to have consistency if there are tiny layers versus trying to get something in a big step. Like you're trying to get your dog to jump up on something and you use a cookie, right? You're trying to get them onto the top of something. And you know, what I might do is take the mat that's on the top of it and put it on the ground and shape them to jump on there and have joy mm -hmm. for that. And then mm -hmm. we might take that whatever big high thing and lower it half that distance and then put that mat on there. They'll jump up easy. Boom, 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 boom. It, you know, you could get them with a cookie lure, but there's, you're building in that, that hesitancy, that unsure, and you're probably going to have to go back to it many, many times. But what we're talking about is empowering the dog. And I think, mm -hmm. remember uh, last week when we were on a Zoom, 
so the three of us jump on Zoom and we geek out about science. We were talking about the power of choice, but by empowering a dog, that what is more mm -hmm. reinforcing than reinforcement? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is that the dog has agency to mm -hmm. be in control mm -hmm. of their reinforcement. And I think shaping behaviors is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Right. Like there, there is control all the time, right? Like in, yeah, in, in shaping, the dog is in control. And then, yeah, this control is just a huge reinforcer for them itself. So like this, yes, it's just... And it's so. maybe especially, it can be especially seen in dogs who are afraid of different uh, things. So Frida really panicked uh, in different situations. And giving her this training, this choice-based training where she was really in control. Actually, when we did pick the puppy up, she, she traveled with us and was the first time in a hotel. And she was just a superstar, um, oh, really? really, because she felt like I am control uh, in control here. And she would have been freaked out uh, yeah, yeah, in, in the beginning, dog. but yeah. now, th thanks to those layers and thanks to really experiencing that she is in charge of uh, the situations. Yeah, she which was is really funny because good. when I first started dog training as a balanced dog trainer, back then it was all about being in control of the dog. Isn't you need it? to correct yeah. them so that they know you're in mm -hmm. control. They need mm -hmm. to know that they have to. And the, mm -hmm. the funny thing is that, I mean, my dogs back then were wonderful in spite of how I trained them, but that when we give them that power of that control, that the understanding and the willingness to mm -hmm. do as we ask. So mm -hmm. the irony is what people try to get by making a dog do something comes naturally when you hand over the control and you allow mm -hmm. the dog to guide the session. And unless you really understand layers of learning, it may sound like we're letting these dogs run amok and do anything they want, but it's not, it's just, it's choice-based training where you set up all of the contingencies to get the behavior you want so that you can reinforce the dog. I mean, that's, that's all we. And it's so important for the mental health of every living being to be in mm. control yeah so if we don't have the feeling of control it's where depressions uh, start mm. yeah, yeah that's such a great point is yeah think of times when you see that you have no power over what people are saying or doing mm. and yeah at first you might be frustrated but what if you're locked into that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that what mm -hmm. that would do to your your spirit first, then your mind, and then your body. Mm -hmm. So this is a great That's quote from, from Kay. Mm -hmm. Most people I see want a quick fix because they feel the layers take too long. What they don't realize is management lasts the whole lifetime. That is another ironic thing that you don't want to be bothered putting in the layers. You don't have time to put in the layers for your dog, which honestly that I kind of have a problem with that mentality because I've decided you're not worth the investment of my time. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mm -hmm. that gives me the right to use force to get you to do what I want. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe a goldfish would have been a better choice of a pet then. So, um, but actually, it really doesn't take long. So I think no, we don't have. That's the misunderstanding. Yeah, mm -hmm. completely. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have Frida for a year now. It's not. No. Only for several months. And I mean, she's. People would think she's, uh, yeah, from very plant breeding yes. and uh, <laughs> excellent upbringing and fantastic training from the beginning. So, yeah, it yeah. was like how old super was she when you got her? her. How old she was she? one year when we got her. Okay, so similar to Tater Salad then. Oh yes, yeah. oh yes. He, he yeah. was fifteen months, I think, when we got him. That is the craziness: is that people don't realize how fast this happens. Mm -hmm. it, yes, yeah. yes. So mm -hmm. with Frida, it was super fast. Like we had some really great successes after ten days, mm -hmm. and then of course everything had to be generalized more, and like, and of course there was more training uh, happening. And then after two months, like 
she was she was just a pet and just not we always on the first day we start with the first three colors exercise and then we just progress with the games that's amazing and that is how it happens if like simone said at the beginning trust the process yes. right when you just play the games and even if you aren't a hundred percent sure let the dog tell you if things are going well. Yep. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if your only measure is the dog's level of uh, willingness to play with you, their willingness to, to buy into that session, the, the temp that says I'm having fun. Right. Mm -hmm. And if that's mm -hmm. your, that's all you need as your benchmark, mm -hmm. it being correct isn't as important as that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very true. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I also, I think it's like any, like all the training you can do, like as soon as you start, there will be an improvement. Like it's, yeah, it's just um, like uh, the, you can do so much training and then there will be uh, so much in, improvement. Like it's just, yeah, just follows the rules. <laughs> so what about the people who, they're first time dog owner and they have a problem, like, all of this sounds really good because the three of us are professional dog trainers. How can we instill in that first time dog trainer? There is light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train. Like how do we get them to trust the process? We certainly would always suggest finding a mentor. So in mm. every area of life, it's so good to, to be coached and the, yeah, to have somebody sharing their knowledge, which you so yeah, graciously do. So uh, we would always suggest joining mm. recallers, of course, for a first right. time. That, dog that's callers. actually, that's a really good point because there's so much, content that people put out for free online and not all of it is really worth investing your time in. So there's something more important than investing your money in a program. Yes. So recallers, I think it's probably $500 and on the website it's seven or $800. So it is people's at $500. That's an investment, but worse than a, the $500 is the investment of your time spending a year trying to do something with your dog. That isn't the right path. And mm -hmm. you're going to end up in a worse place if you invest. Mm -hmm. And that's something I believed in. It's such an important point, Simone. Everything mm -hmm. I've ever done when I wanted to learn about fitness, when I wanted to learn mm -hmm. about sprinting, when I wanted to learn about music, or about business, about, of course, animal training. Mm -hmm. It's always, I've always, mm -hmm. always had, you know, m many more than just one mentor mm -hmm. in a year. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah, and that's awesome that uh, people can join uh, recallers uh, tonight because, of course, there is so much awesome information now with 200 podcast episodes. Yes. But of course, like the uh, step by like if you just need the step by step and just need the program to like this is where you start. This is the first game, and then from there you go to the second game and so on. So yeah, definitely. I, I actually started the podcast for our recaller students because I looked at recallers as the the like the foundation blocks to have this amazing relationship. But maybe those blocks needed some mortar in between and mm -hmm. to fill in the gaps so that yeah. people had a better mm -hmm. understanding of what we were sharing in recallers. And so that's really why we started the podcast was to help bring clarity and confidence to that. And so, yeah, that was the uh, motivation to, to get the podcast going. And then of course we understood that we were helping so many other dog owners that maybe lived in a country where they couldn't afford to to join one of our programs but, but when it's possible for you that's exactly what nadine did were you a, you were a member of recallers before you started following me to seminars right when i was in europe we actually started with the sport of agility to be able to come to an agility seminar with you. Yes, yes. <laughs> so yes, right. we were in recallers already. And then we saw, oh, she's coming to Europe, but it was for agility. So yes. then we were like, okay, we have to train a dog. So at least <laughs> some agility, so then we can participate. And we did, oh, that's yeah, what that's we did. <laughs> that is so funny. And then, yeah, and later on, she came in and um, answered a, a job to come and be here and be mentored. And, 
and then that it's just how many times were you over here in was it two or three times mentor uh, it was four here? times it was four, four times, times. Was one year it was twice so oh yes. that's right so <laughs> it's been amazing so we're just going to keep talking because <laughs> oh <laughs> so this morning linda and i were talking about how and this was mentioned in the podcast, and that was the first thing you talked about. Uh, Linda's in a horse group where there uh, is it is it rehabilitation fear in horses? Is that what you're talking? Behavior. So it's behavior, and they talk about that it's not just training; it's the physiology of the animal, right? It's the in horses generally we talk about the need for friends and freedom. No, uh, hey. there's another F. Friends foraging and freedom, right? So with with dogs, like we 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 have to fill their their cup, their spiritual cup. We have to mm -hmm. fill what they need, mm -hmm. and it's nutrition, and it's exercise, and it's mm -hmm. whatever that enrichment is for that particular breed. Mm -hmm. So uh, a breed like Frida, I bet you scenting is a big part of mm -hmm. what fills her cup, and so definitely. Most people just go to breed. Yeah, but and the social part too. To like breed. she's she's. A very social dog too, so she really also needs the interaction with uh, with other dogs. Mm -hmm. And I was saying this. Uh, I was out for supper with a, a couple of friends who had a problem with their dog, and and um, I said, "There's some things that will take you years to incrementally improve on a behavior problem. That mm -hmm. if you changed the nutrition." that you will see a change in that dog, like the brain fog gets lifted. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's just so many other things other than just how can we fix this? Yeah, we can't yeah. Fix yeah if you behavior. think we about have to look at the whole yeah. animal. Mm -hmm. Stress is um, affecting the digestive system, but it's also the other way around. So mm -hmm. the digestion is also... Uh, um, affecting how the, the the brain works. So if we really take care of good nutrition, it, it will just uh, help improve behavior. So we always feel that's a super important uh, part. And also there we work with our um, special coach who helps us yeah. uh, find yeah. the best solution. We all need a mentor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So with every dog we take in, also every foster dog, we would also look at the nutrition uh, on the first day too and try to figure it all out and uh, improve. And this is, it is a huge part, as, as you say. And I mean, when we took Frida in, she really, I have never seen such cheap food uh, we've worked a long time in rescue but it was uh, the cheapest food i've ever seen and of course her digestive system was just uh, ruined so uh. of course you need to take care of the microbiome and uh, this will yeah so uh, huge. help improve uh, so the behavior mm -hmm. yeah. and then the so other hurts. thing you said about uh, exercise that's i think that's a huge one too like uh, also with the example with uh, Frida that was like because she's a dog with so much energy right and uh, before she came uh, to us she was uh, living like in a, a backyard and not getting any exercise anymore so, so uh, then we started also to build her body up actually and just to yeah so now she can uh, go for this like like I um, take her with the bike and she just runs and she just can get all the energy out of her body. So this is a huge part, of course, too. Of, of This everything. is such a, uh, you know, John said, I need a mentor to bounce ideas off. And this is how it works. You mm -hmm. decide where your passion is. And for most of people watching this, it is dogs. And then you, you decide what mentor, what community is your people and then mm -hmm. you join in the community of it and that's where people will come to homeschool the dog or recallers or just hang out at shape by dogs and then then you decide okay i've got the hang of it i want to elevate my my understanding and so yeah. you then will go to a higher level so in our program we have the inner circle which is a, a, a smaller intimate group where we do have mm -hmm. more what you have one-on-one -on -one discussions and then Every once in a while, if we put out, we've got a mentorship, then uh, <laughs> then you get to pick my brain. 
thank you, ladies. I'm going to let you go. Uh, thank yeah, you for being thank here. You. You're amazing. Thank Swagger you so much. Out. A lot of out. people were talking to you tonight. There's going to be a lot of barking. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. <laughs>